mate. We'll talk about harvester fires now and a few experiences with harvester fires. Uh, yeah, just build up with chaff behind the gearbox so you can't blow out very well. Yeah. There's one over here as well. Uh, yeah, like static electricity, potentially. All right, we're going to talk about that um, in a tick. Yeah. And, and yeah, perhaps a bit of flint on a, on a front. Yep. Um, there she goes. And the issues you had? What uh, yeah, beans. And beans, okay. So look, there, there are some issues, and, and, and so Condition Group's done a fair bit of research uh, on harvester fires, and we've spoken to hundreds of farmers around the country, asked them when they've had fires and what crops um, they've been in and what's sort of caused the fire. 50% of all harvester fires came down to two things. One was bearing failure, and anyone had a bearing fire and get pretty bloody hot, yep. So bearing failure is one, and the other one is dust and chaff build up around the machine, and you get, as, just, as we're talking about, those incendiaries that come off the exhaust system. Um, and ignite a pile of chaff or, or trash on the machine. The issue is that that some of this dust is really highly flammable. Anyone have a, have a, want to have a guess at, at how low a temperature that uh, lentil dust, for example, can uh, ignite? What if I told you 160 degrees? Well, it's pretty bloody low. And as an idiot who's gotten up on one of these machines, uh, I can tell you with, with a thermal camera, looking around that machine when it's in full steam, um, there's plenty of components on that machine that are running at over 160 degrees. So, you know, there's plenty of areas where you might get some ignition. Um, so if we talk then about what we can do uh, about those issues, look, who's got, who carries one of those in their header cab? Yep, if you haven't got one, go and grab one. Now that's an expensive Milwaukee one, but equally you can get some cheaper ones for 50 to 100 bucks. You can get them from Bunnings. Any um, auto store will have them as well. And they're a really great tool to go around and just check bearing temperatures on the machine. And while I can't tell you what temperature any particular bearing is going to run at, depending on what preload it's uh, running at and, and what uh, speed, etc., they all run at different temperatures. But get a bit of an idea as to what the bearing temp's typically running at. Keep a bit of a log. Get an idea as to you know uh, you know what, what the typical operating temperature for that bearing is. And if you start to see it rise, get in early and replace it because. Um, you know, failure is generally pretty rapid, uh, and also you, you're likely to throw white hot metal around the place and cause yourself some grief with fire. So, so that's the bearing side of things. Look, there's always going to be bearings that you can't get to, but you know that comes down to a maintenance side of things. And, and uh, you know, fronts are, are notorious for for, uh, for throwing bearings, and I, I say that because we had a uh, honeybee front that threw a bearing uh, about 10 years ago. Went in underneath the, uh, uh, the hydraulic reservoir that sat at the back of those honeybee fronts. It took out the reservoir, the whole machine was gone in 10 minutes. So, you know, the, the, the troublesome part of all of that was that my cousin at the time was driving, thought he'd try and put it out, ended up in hospital for three days with burns. Not recommended, okay? So just remember these things can be replaced and people are pretty hard to replace. So, um, so look, yeah, that's the, that's the bearing story. Um, I think the other thing is that, you know, from a clean down perspective, uh, we've got to try and clean down as often as we can. We're always going to get issues with incendiaries off that exhaust system. There are things we can do. We can insulate, uh, and, and so there are, um, there are uh, both manufacturers and, all, and also uh, dealers, uh, particularly in this part of the world, that will put a, a second skin on that exhaust system, try and, and, and insulate it a little bit. Um, uh, grow, uh, some of the, the dealers further north are using double ceramic coatings, you know, to try and make that, that, uh, that uh, exhaust system or the exhaust system components as smooth as possible so that dust doesn't stick to it and then fall down, you know. Um, the alternative is, uh, is a lower cost option is a product out of WA called uh, Metal Fix by, uh, from a company called Phoenix Paints. Uh, four or five coats of that, you get a bit of a small insulative effect, but also it just smooths out the rough uh, surfaces on any of those exhaust components that you might get incendiaries forming on. So there's a few things you can do from, a, a, um, from an exhaust system perspective to try and minimise the risk there. Um, but, but regular blowdowns are, are, the, are the obvious ones. Start at the top, work your way down. Start at the front, work your way back. That's the general rule of thumb. Don't work over yourself. So has anyone tried one of those uh, large Venturi uh, style lancers with the green handle on it. There's a couple yesterday that had and, and said that they'd worked pretty well. You do need a pretty hefty uh, compressor, uh, about uh, at least 120 CFM I understand, but they do shift a big volume of air. And of course you've also got um, the, the likes of the uh, higher voltage uh, cordless tools. Anyone run a Milwaukee grease gun? Yep, quite a few. 
So, you know, go and buy yourself a, a, um, an 18 volt um, blower skin, uh, keep it in the, in the header cab, just handy for blowdowns. And, and Brett uses one when he's cleaning out the out inside of a machine when we're going to change, change rasp bars over, they work pretty well. So maybe grab yourself one of those pre-harvest and the beauty is you can just leave it in the header cab as well. So um, extinguishers, uh, make sure your extinguishers are fully charged, powder style, your ABEs with the white band on them, I like to see one. Uh, up the front and then another one in the engine bay. Um, if you do have those, just give them a turnover every 12 months. Make sure that the powder that's in the bottom of those hasn't clumped because sometimes that can happen. And remember that if you have used them at any stage, they'll need to be recharged because once you, uh, once you use them, the powder um, uh, ensures that that seal uh, doesn't ever go back together again properly. So they've got to be um, properly uh, recharged. Um, fire suppression systems. Has anyone had a look at one of those at, at all for a harvester? We're looking at 10 to 15 grand for one of those these days. Um, if you're not familiar with how they work, they generally have a, uh, a, a, a large reservoir, if you like, of uh, water and, and triple F uh, that sits up in the engine bay. It's pressurised, typically with nitrogen. There are lines running all around the machine. The mining industry has been using for years, Andrew, you would have seen a lot of that in the mining industry. Pretty much every machine, isn't it? And so we've got million dollar machines now kicking around with none of that on it, why we don't do it for the sake of 15 grand on bugger if I know, but a bit, I think it's definitely worth having a think about, particularly if you're in fire prone crops like uh, lentils and uh, some pulse crops. So um, I think the, one of the more, most important things uh, really is, is to sit down with your team uh, prior to harvest. Sorry, one thing we haven't touched on yet is static. And I, I'll, I'll mention static because we've done a bit of work in the static space. Static's a real bugger because it tends to attract a lot of fine material, okay? Uh, and, and you end up with uh, a lot of fuel on the machine. To, to dissipate uh, the static charge off a machine is actually pretty hard because we're operating in an environment that's really low humidity, it's dry. We can try and drag a chain, but you can imagine the conductivity of a chain just dragging along the ground. Think about an electric fence, what we have to do to earth that. You know, uh, we're trying to get spikes right down the ground. So, to dissipate static energy is, is very difficult. The issue that, that uh, with static in terms of it causing fires is, is a little bit of a fallacy in a sense in that um, there's just not enough energy in a static spark to actually ignite even the most flammable of dust. So we went around and, and, uh, and tested a whole heap of really nasty bitey uh, harvesters, measured the static energy on those. When we went to replicate it in the lab with the most flammable dust we could find, we couldn't, get a we couldn't get a smolder out of it unless we multiplied the static energy charge by 10, 10 times and put it in a continuous arc. So static won't, charge, won't, won't actually start the fire. If you've got, if you've got um, issues on a, on a machine that you think oh, it must be static, go looking uh, around the machine for areas where you might be getting some incendiaries potentially coming off the exhaust system, okay? And, and one place to look is the concave doors. So the seals on the concave doors, just go and check those and make sure that they are really well sealed up because if you think about if, you, where you've, if you've got a leak on the concave door, say on the left-hand side of the machine, where's it gonna blow all that really fine dust? Straight up onto the exhaust system, right? So you're gonna end up with a heap more incendiaries. So check that out. Um, but as I, as I was saying, you know, get, get uh, there's a back pocket guide from GRDC, get a copy of that right, and sit down with your harvest team prior to harvest and make sure everyone knows what's going to happen if there is a fire. If you are in the machine and you're the driver when, and there's a fire, pull out of the crop, face into the wind, just try and get out in, into an open area so you, you give yourself the best possible chance of trying to put the fire out but also not putting, uh, setting the crop on fire and of course who's the first person typically at the, uh, at the scene of a harvest of fire? Chase bin driver? Make sure they're up to speed with, um, with you know, firefighting, how to operate the, the, uh, the extinguishers. And, and I'd encourage you to, to mount a, uh, a, a firefighting uh, unit on your chaser bin. They're pretty straightforward. I've seen plenty of examples where, you know, guys either use a, you know, they might use something pretty cheap like a petrol powered um, Honda. But equally, there's, there's options for, because it's on the chaser bin, you can uh, set it up with a high pro. Um, and, and solenoids, you can, you can uh, switch uh, water flow on from the cab. So that's, that's definitely an option, okay? Um, any other comments or thoughts on fires before we move on? I think that's the main thing, is really just make sure that you know uh, 
you know, who's going to do what, make sure you've got all the contact numbers for emergency services, for your neighbours, UHF channels, all that stuff. Just get a bit of a list, put on a laminated card, keep it in the header and chase it in cab and just make sure the whole team knows what's going to happen. I will just quickly touch on bogging because that's potentially an issue this year. Um, typically try and pull from the front axle. Might be an idea in a year like this to maybe make yourself up a bridle um, where you can actually get to the front axle before you get in the bog because it's never fun digging in under there. Um, uh, don't use chains, guys. Use uh, snatch straps. Uh, there's products called uh, uh, the, the um, Black Snake, which is a Kevlar um, rope uh, product. And it's, it's got eyelets at the end. It's designed specifically for that purpose. Um, I've been asked a couple of times what sort of weight should we, you know, what sort of rating, uh, weight rating should we be getting. Uh, the manufacturers tell me about 100 tonne is what, is what most people go for. Um, they aren't cheap. Uh, if you are going to get the, the, the webbing straps, uh, the snatch straps, uh, there are some made by uh, CWI over in the west, uh, make some with tethers on them as well. So if, if that strap does uh, snap for some reason, it's typically where it's stitched onto the eyelet, um, they've got a tether so it pulls it to one side and doesn't take out the operator in the, uh, in the tractor. I don't know. I sort of be worth mentioning that because this is probably the year where it's going to happen and unfortunately in WA we've, we've lost two pretty good farmers over there this year due to uh, misadventure when trying to pull out of bogs. Not good.